Good morning. Welcome to the Highlands. Thank you so much for being here to worship. If you're watching online, thank you for tuning in. How many of you guys still without power? Anybody? Power, everyone. We just got ours we back. We just got power back. Super excited. My neighbor just texted me. It's pretty exciting times, guys. Let's it's stand up. Things. We're going to get ready to worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we are so thankful to be in your house today. God, we direct our attentions and our energies and our spirit to be aligned with yours and to join yours this morning that your presence would just surround us. God, fill us with spirit and truth as we worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Your love never changes 
creating one God Almighty Through your Holy Spirit Conceiving Christ the Son Jesus our Savior
gonna be afraid I'm not gonna be afraid I'm not gonna fear the storm You are greater than it all And I'm not gonna fear the storm Father, we love you. We thank you for your presence this morning. We come to worship you, to experience you, to, to have a fresh awakening, God. And when we think of those words, peace be still, I'm reminded of when Jesus, in the midst of a storm on the Sea of Galilee with a boat full of disciples, stepped to the front of the boat and simply said, peace be still be still and that terrible storm was calmed in an instant the disciples experienced your power God sometimes we look in the midst of the powerful things for you at work as we've all gone through the, the storms and the, and the wind and the power that was demonstrated in that and, and, and yet you reminded Moses that Sometimes you're not in that. That it's in the moments when we are still and quiet. And so God, in the quietness of this moment, let us still our minds, let us still our thoughts. 
and let us hear you whisper the truth, the power for living eternally, the message that you have for each of us. God, open our ears that we would hear and open our lives that we would surrender. We love you, God, and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I'm glad that you are here. And if you're watching with us by internet, I'm glad that you are with us as well. And, and I've been told this morning it's a little glitchy. So just kind of hang with us as best you can. You know, we've all been through the, the storms this week and we're thankful for our linemen and for those that work so hard to get our power back on. Uh, and sometimes when we think about that, I, I forget sometimes the road crews who do such a wonderful job. And, and I was reminded of that this time because both ends of our road were blocked and we had to wait for them to come through uh, so that we could even get out and experience that. And so we're thankful for all of those folks who work hard. And, you know, I, I almost enjoyed the, the peace of the few moments until everybody got their generators out and got them running. Uh, but in that quietness, I was talking with Luke before the service this morning. He said, you know, it was like living back in the 1800s. And, and, and we romantically think about those times when, when there's no power and you're kind of isolated and you enjoy living off the land and, and, until you realize that they didn't have plumbing in the 1800s either. And, and, and we romantically think about those things until the, the reality of the conveniences that we're used to. And, and so we're thankful for all of those folks who worked hard to get our power back on. We continue to pray for those folks uh, in our community. There's still a lot of folks here this morning who don't have power, and we're thankful that you could be with us. And as difficult as these days have been for us, you know, it doesn't compare to what folks along the, the Gulf Coast have gone through. And so we continue to, to pray for those folks and to look for opportunities and ways that we can help them as well. This morning, our passage of scripture comes from 1 Samuel chapter 24. But before we get there, I want to look at a, at a brief verse from Mark chapter 8. Uh, Jesus was trying to explain to the disciples that he was going to die. The disciples had, had bought into what Jesus was doing in his ministry because they believed he was setting up an earthly kingdom. And, and they were counting themselves as being in kind of on the ground floor of this new kingdom. And so Simon Peter pulls Jesus aside and, and rebukes him. Can you imagine having enough gumption that you can rebuke Jesus? Well, that's kind of where Simon was. He pulled him over and he said, Jesus, you're not going to die. This is all a wonderful plan of God and it's going to work out. And, and Jesus stopped and looked at him and called him Satan. And he said, you've got your mind on the things of the world and not the things of God. It's easy for us to point fingers at Simon and say, he should have known better. He, he should have had his mind on the things of God. He was in the presence of Jesus. He lived with Jesus. But how often do we allow our minds and our priorities to drift to the things of the world and, and not the things of God? And so after that moment, Jesus said in Mark, in, in chapter 8 and verse 34, he, he called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple. He's not talking about, when we use that word disciple, we instantly think of the 12. Jesus prayed all night and then he got up the next morning and he went and chose the 12 men that were to carry on his message after he was gone. They lived with Jesus and experienced Jesus and they learned from Jesus for over three years. 
But here Jesus is talking about general disciples. Anyone who wants to be a dedicated follower of Jesus. And we use that term follower sometimes, and it means a lot of different things. Sometimes we call ourselves Christ followers or Jesus followers. But there was different kinds of folks that followed Jesus, and there were those that were simply followers. If you read through the gospel stories and follow the life of Jesus, when he would go to a town, there would be a crowd that would gather because they wanted to see what Jesus was going to do. And in that crowd, there was typically very few disciples, not just the 12, but those who were seeking to live according to Jesus. That's what that term disciple means. It means that you are following a teacher and seeking to emulate their actions and their teachings. And so here Jesus said, if you want to be a disciple. And and so I think there probably was some that wanted to be disciples of Jesus that weren't chosen in the 12. I immediately think of Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus who sought to live for Jesus. And as we look at them, we would call them disciples. Not the 12 chosen, but they were not just followers of Jesus. They weren't people in the crowd that were just going along for the show and for the entertainment of what was happening. And so Jesus said, look, there's a difference of just being in the crowd and being a disciple. And it's your choice. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, there's a requirement. And the first one is to deny yourself. Jesus said, anyone that wants to be a disciple must deny themselves. Who's up for that? Who's up for denying themselves? You know, we talked just a moment ago about living without power and living without water if you're on a well. We can kind of stretch and do that for a day or two, but but once we get beyond about the second day, it really becomes uncomfortable, doesn't it? It really becomes something that's a, a hassle and a bother in our life. Who wants to give up the things that we want? We have desires and we have things that that we want to attain and acquire. Is Jesus calling us to deny ourselves in such a way that we live as a pauper? That we are to give up all of our possessions, to give up everything we have and and go live in in a closed-in building, a community? That's sometimes what we think when we think of denying ourselves. You know, if if Jesus was wanting to gain followers, why is he making it hard? Shouldn't he say, look, if you'll follow me, you'll have all the riches and everything that you ever wanted, and life's just going to be wonderful. That's the way to gain followers. Not telling them, if you follow me, you've got to deny yourself. Well, Jesus was not telling them to, to be paupers. There were those in the early church that did give up everything. They brought everything together and shared as a community. And in Acts, it tells us that that nobody was in need because everybody sought to meet each other's needs. But what he was talking about was is that you have to put God as the priority. You have to deny your thoughts, your desires, and your way of living and exchange that for God's. And that sounds like a terrible thing. It sounds like, oh, goodness, I've got to give up everything and and go be a missionary in Africa somewhere. That's what I thought early on in my life. I remember when when a missionary came to our church and was speaking, and I'm thinking, if that's what it's like to follow God, I don't want anything to do with it. Now that I'm older and have had some missionary experiences, I think maybe that is a good thing to do. But, But at a younger age, that was not what I wanted to do, but... But that wasn't what God called me to do. God created each of us. Psalm 139, we talk about it often. It says that God knit us together. He formed us in our mother's womb. And when he did that, he created you with certain desires and affinities and things that you are good at and things that you enjoy doing. And so when God calls us to deny ourselves, it's not to... Forget everything that we enjoy doing and doing something we hate. 
It's actually part of God's plan when he created us. He created us to fill a slot in his kingdom, a purpose. And when we deny ourselves, we're actually doing the right thing by getting onto God's page, by doing what God created us to do. And yet often we look at that as a terrible thing to to deny ourselves. But it is a hard thing. Because we have certain desires, we have certain things, sometimes that have been programmed in us by our situation and our circumstance and our place in life. And sometimes those things are not the things that God wants for us. And that those moments, it, denying ourselves does become a difficult thing. But if we choose to be a disciple, we must de- deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. We have spiritualized the cross. We have almost romanticized the cross as well we should because it is the method that we receive salvation. What Jesus accomplished on the cross provided for our forgiveness and eternity with him. And yet at the day when Jesus said this, he was speaking about an an execution about a form of death. If Jesus were to say this today, he would say, you must deny yourself, take up your electric chair, and follow me. In other words, he's saying, you not only have to deny yourself, you have to die to yourself. You have to pick up your death to follow him. In other words, we die to ourselves. We die to that human nature which causes us to react and do a lot of the things that we do. There's a choice. We choose to be disciples. We choose to deny ourselves and follow Jesus. Or we choose to indulge the human nature and we choose to to live our life the way that we want to. The topic of our sermon this morning is, is revenge. And revenge is a very human emotion. It's a very human desire. It's a very natural thing for us to want to get even. To pay people back for what they've done, especially to us. This morning, our passage of scripture comes from 1 Samuel chapter 24. It's about David and his interactions with King Saul. David, if you know part of that story, remember he was chosen by God to succeed King Saul as the king of Israel. And and God sends Samuel to Jesse's house to anoint one of his sons to become the king of Israel. And Jesse goes all the way down the line of all the sons and God says, no, none of them are it. And there were no more sons left. And so Samuel says to Jesse, do you have any more sons? And he says, oh yeah, I forgot, David's out tending the sheep. So they bring David in and God affirms that David is the next king of Israel. And he instructs Samuel to anoint him. But at that moment of anointing, David doesn't become the king of Israel. There are still processes and things that David has to learn and experiences that he must go through. And so from that moment, David knows that God has promised him to be king, and yet he's not able to live that out. And yet David has some great moments in his life. He's able to kill the giant Goliath down in the valley, and all of the the armies of Israel were cheering for David. And David began to become popular, and King Saul resented that, and he became jealous And he had David come and work in the king because David was a musician and Saul would be prone to fits of of depression and rage and anger. And so David would come and play music for him and help soothe Saul. But, But all of that anger that Saul had and all the jealousy would overpower him and he would try to kill David. At one point he even threw a spear and tried to kill him while he was in the kingdom playing music. David is smart enough to realize that he needs to get away from Saul. 
And so he begins to spend part of his life on the run, hiding from Saul. And Saul pursues David for years. Not weeks, not months, but years. Saul is bent on killing David because he figures out that David is also going to become the next king of Israel. And so they have several different encounters, and and David is actually out in the wilderness hiding, and Saul comes after him again. And that's where our story picks up in 1 Samuel chapter 24, in verse 1. It says, after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told that David is in the desert of En Gedi. And so Saul took 3,000 able young men from all of Israel, He's pursuing one man. At this point, David's probably got about 600 men or so that are following him. And so Saul comes after him with 3,000. He's determined to wipe David and his followers off the face of the earth. And so they set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. Wouldn't that be a wonderful address? Where do you live? I live at four crag of the wild goats. It's where the greens live now, isn't it? <laughs> That's where he went. He went to the crags of the wild goats. David was hiding in some of the caves there. Saul learned that he was somewhere in the area. And so in verse 3, Saul and his men come down through a valley. It says in verse 3, he came to the sheep pens along the way. He said a cave was there, and and Saul went in to relieve himself. This is part of how how we know the Bible's real, because it it tells us of of these unfortunate events and things like this that happen. It's a very natural thing. You know, we kind of romanticize about road trips, and we enjoy being out on the road and enjoying all the things, but there comes time when we have to take a, a rest break. And that was the very real thing that happened with Saul. As they were traveling along, he had to come to a point and he had to take a rest break. And so as he finds a cave, he picks the very cave that David and his men were in the back of. Can you imagine of all the caves in all that area, you live around the mountains, you realize there are some caves here and caves there. But in that part of the world, there was so much limestone in that area. There were, there were caves just all over the place. Out of all the caves that Saul could pick, he picked the one where David and his men were hiding. Saul comes in in verse 4. David's men say to him, This is the day that the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with them as you wish. And so David's men begin to tell David what God says. And it's kind of interesting. David's their leader, and and David has obviously shown that he has a very close relationship with God and that he has been leading these men. But yet these men come and say, look, David, here it is. Here's your chance. Out of all the caves that there are, we were hiding in this one, and God has brought Saul and put him right here for you to take his life. It's the chance you've been waiting for. It's the opportunity for you to become the king of Israel. David began to listen to what they said. And there in the last part of verse 4, it says, David crept up unnoticed. And cut off a corner of Saul's robe. What happened to David? This was his big chance. It was his opportunity to impress the men that were following him. It was his chance to seize the moment. To seize the throne of Israel. You see, that's the way a lot of kings were determined in that period of time. It wasn't a a democratic vote. It wasn't a popular vote or an electoral college delegate vote. It was a power overthrow. And here's David, promised to be the king of Israel, with the current king right before him in the very most 
most vulnerable position you could be in. And David has the knife, and it has to be going through his mind. I can take his life. I can take his life. And when the moment comes for him to do it, he just cuts off a corner of the robe and comes back to the men. And the men had to be saying, David, what's wrong with you? Are you a scaredy cat? Are you afraid? Are you chicken? What happened? Did your nerves get you? Did, did you not, were you not able to follow through with it? David was preparing to take Saul's life. And as he thought through that, he went through those processes and all the different things, all the different outcomes had to flash through his mind in those moments. And I say that because you and I are faced with monumental decisions, life-changing moments. And in those moments, most people think through all the different scenarios and all the different outcomes and what happens if I do this and what happens if I do that. And all of that happens in just a brief moment and that happened with David. And he made the choice not to take Saul's life, but to take the corner of his robe. Now here's Saul, who's been pursuing David for years, not to have a meal with him, not to sit down and be buddies and make amends, to kill him. David would have been completely justified had he taken King Saul's life. There would be no questions asked. Everybody would say, you know, Saul had been trying to kill him all these years. David finally took advantage of it and took him out. God had promised David to be king of Israel, and so now he gets to be king of Israel. But look at what it says in verse 5. As he cut that piece of robe off and he came back and he started thinking about it, it said, afterward, David's conscious, the guilt began to strike him. Because he cut off the corner of King Saul's robe. David didn't kill him. David didn't take advantage of him when he was in his most vulnerable position. All he did was cut off his robe. What, what harm is that going to be? So when he gets up, his robe's going to be a little lopsided. There's going to be a spot missing. Who's going to notice that? And yet David was so bothered with that because that was not the right thing to do. And so David goes and turns to his men and he says this in verse 6. The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. He is the Lord's anointed. The Lord forbid should I lay my hand upon him for he is anointed of the Lord. David realized in those moments that there are right things to do, there are permissible things to do, and there are wrong things to do. And David, even though he didn't do the wrong thing by taking Saul's life, he still didn't do what God wanted him to do because he took advantage of God's anointed person when they were most vulnerable David turns to his men and he says, look, this is not God's plan. This is not the way God wanted it to unfold. And in verse 7, he says, with these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. I can hear one of those men saying, look, David, if you're not going to do it, we're going to do it. And David said, you're not going to touch him. This is God's man in God's time, and God's going to work it out the way God needs to. That took some courage. That took some boldness because that could have caused all of those men that were following him to say, look, we're done with you, David. This was your chance. This was our opportunity to become the leaders of Israel, and you blew it. We don't want anything to do with you. But David still chose to do the right thing, even in the face of being unpopular and being in a difficult place. In the meantime, Saul does what he needs to do and exits the cave. He heads down into the valley to, to rejoin his men. 
And David, sitting here with this piece of robe in his hand, thinks, what should I do next? And so in verse 8, David goes out of the cave and he calls out to Saul, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Here is a man who has spent the last years. David's done everything he could to help King Saul. He defeated the giant. He, he played music for him when he was out of his mind. He did everything he could to honor King Saul. And yet Saul still tried to kill him. And yet in that moment when David had the opportunity to kill him, he chose not to do it. And then even as Saul leaves, he calls out for Saul and he bows down and shows respect to King Saul. Not because Saul was right, not because Saul was a good king, but because God had anointed Saul as the king of Israel. He wasn't worshiping the man, he wasn't worshiping the situation, he was worshiping the God who was in control of it all. You see, that's a hard thing for us to grasp a hold of sometimes because we want things to happen the way we want them. And we see events and we see circumstances and we think this is the way it ought to happen. And when it doesn't, we get mad, we get bent out of shape, and we throw a fit. Or we kick and fight against it and try to pursue our own methods without a single consideration of what is God doing. If you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow God. It's kind of easy to say. It's kind of easy when we read that. But when we come down to it, why in the world would, would Saul still be alive? Why would David let him live in that moment? Because he chose to deny himself. I believe that there was every natural inclination within David to kill Saul at that moment. And yet he denied that urge and was obedient to God. As David called out to Saul in verse 9, he says, Why do you listen when other men say, David is bent on harming you? This day you've seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave, and some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. And I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. He says, see Saul, I took this corner of your robe, but I did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I'm guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you. But you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me. Man, the desire to get even, the desire to pay back is overwhelming within our human self. To right the wrongs that have been done to us is a natural thing. David had to fight against those natural desires to spare Saul's life. But here's the thing. He didn't just cut off the robe and go back to the back of the cave and says, okay, see, I was that close to him. And then they all just went about their merry way. He still confronted Saul with the truth. And that's part of, of what needs to happen in situations where we've been wronged. God doesn't say, tuck your tail and run and hide. But he does say, revenge is not for you. It is important that the truth be told. It is important that people know what's going on. Now, did David have the ability to control how Saul responded? Not at all. And as a matter of fact, here's what Saul did. Saul said, David, you're a much better man than I am. And God has anointed you to become king of Israel. And I swear to you an oath today... I will not seek to harm you any longer. And he went off and went on his way. And you know what Saul did? Just a short time later, he was out ready to kill David again. We can't control what people do when the truth is told. We are simply called to tell the truth. 
David came and said, Saul, look, you're trying to kill me. You're believing people who are telling you lies. Here's the proof. I had the opportunity to take your life, and I didn't do it. That's not my desire. I trust God. I didn't take your life because I trust God, because I choose to be a disciple. Well, he did a, a, a magnificent thing. He stood up. God should have taken care of it and let it all be good from then on. But it wasn't. Saul tried to kill him again. Just because we do the right thing doesn't mean it's all going to be smooth and wonderful and all work out well. As a matter of fact, as you study the Old Testament, you study the New Testament, you look at all the different lives of people who sought to live for God, almost every one of them, their life got more difficult here on earth because they sought to live for God. Because they made a choice to be a disciple and live for God. For us today, there's a couple of things that I want us to, to look at. And the first one is, is that revenge belongs to God. There's a passage of scripture over in Romans chapter 12. Paul is writing to the believers, to the Christians in Rome. And in chapter 12 and verse 17, he says this, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Come on, God. I got to even the score here. They did this, and, and I'm just going to do this. God says, no, it's not your business. It's not your job. And, and he goes on and he says, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Not only are we not to pay back evil for evil, what's the golden rule? Do unto others as they've done to you. No. No. I wish it was that sometimes, don't you? Do unto others. What is it? As Christ has done for you. We're not to repay evil for evil. We're not to get even. We're not to settle the score. We're not to balance the scales. As a matter of fact, he says, as far as it is to do right in the eyes of everyone, well, obviously, this was not written in 2020 because what's right to this group is not right to this group and is not right to that group. So how do we determine what's right? Because some people say this is right and some people say the polar opposite is right. He kind of clarifies it here. He says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, not that it depends on others, that it's up to you to live at peace with everyone. It's your responsibility. It's not you responding to what's been done to you. It's you responding into what God has, has taught you and, and enabled you to live. He says in verse 19, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is mine to avenge, says God. I will repay. Folks, that's hard. To deny our desire, sometimes our need to get revenge. Revenge is a tough word. If we change it, say, well, I'm just going to give them what they deserve. That sounds a little better, doesn't it? Doesn't sound quite so harsh. I'm just doing for them what they deserve. We think back. Has God done for us what we deserve? You see, it's a whole different standard that God calls us to live by, to deny ourselves and to live for God, to live according to God's standard, to live for what God has taught us to do. He said, revenge is mine. He said, you're not in the revenge business. You're not in the payback business. You're not in the judging business. You're not in the deserving business. We're to be in the loving business. 
to love others as Christ has loved us, to treat others as we know we should be treated, as we've been treated by Christ. That's the standard. It's easy to justify. It's easy to make excuses. It brings us to the second piece. It's important to test the advice you receive. Here were David's men. They had seen David's relationship with God. They understood who God was. They understood how God acted. And yet in the moment when David had to make a critical decision, a life-changing, directional, living decision, his friends, the people that he lived with, the people that he trusted, the people who he had been to battle with, shoulder to shoulder, said, God's done a great thing for you. How many times has God gotten the credit or blame for things that he had nothing to do? I believe in that moment, God didn't cause Saul to pick that cave. I think it was a chance. I think it was a Romans 28, 8, or 28, Romans 8, 28 moment. God brings about good things for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It was an opportunity for David to learn about himself and to be obedient to God. And yet those men gave him ungodly wisdom in the name of God. I don't think they intentionally did that. I think that was part of their best advice. Their best advice to David was kill Saul, become the king that God said you were going to be. But they didn't understand God's plan the way that David did. And so for us is to test the advice that we get even from godly people. I've had godly people tell me things that were wrong. And I don't believe they were malicious. I don't believe they had the intent to mislead or misdirect. I think they just didn't understand the situation and hear what God had to say. So what do we test? So we test it. There has to be a standard. What is the standard? What is the foundation that we use to test? It's the scripture. We believe this is the word of God. And we must balance all the things that we say, all the truth that we hear, all the advice that we get off the principles of scripture. We must test the advice because folks people will unintentionally steer you wrong they will unintentionally give you bad advice it's important for us to deny ourselves and listen to what god says the last piece this morning is that we should be a positive influence for god david went back and no doubt faced the ridicule of those men David couldn't do it. David didn't have the stomach. David's not up for the task. And David said to them, you guys misunderstand what God's doing. And it says he rebuked them. He changed their mind. He pointed them to the truth of God. It would have made perfect sense. It would have been logical. For David to take Saul's life and assume the kingship of Israel. It's what God promised. It would be easy to rationalize. But David heard in his conscience. David heard the move of God in his life. Because he had not so seared that conscience. He had not so seared and ignored the word of God that he couldn't hear from God. These men either didn't know the word of God or had chosen to live for themselves so much that they didn't have that sense when God was working in their life. It it comes back to where we started. If you choose to be a disciple, there's a high bar. There's a high goal that is set for you. You must deny yourself and die to yourself. And when we do that, we become a positive influence for those that are around us, for those that have those experiences, for those that are in moments of need and crisis. And oh, folks, how I wish that 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 could be a one-time decision 
that we could choose and say, God, I deny myself and everything's a piece of cake from then on. But it's not. If you choose to be a disciple, you're going to have to choose to deny yourself sometimes many times a day. You're going to have to choose to die to your own natural desires, not for some terrible result, not for some terrible goal to attain, to be who it is that God called you and created you to be. It fits with who you are because that's God's design and purpose. And so it's not a terrible thing to deny yourself and choose God. As a matter of fact, if you go through and study the life of David, his life is on a pretty good track until he chooses to deny God and choose himself. So this morning, the question for you, maybe you have no problem with revenge. Maybe you have no problem with needing to get even. This was just one specific example that we looked at of human nature and desire this morning. But the question really comes down to, do you want to be a disciple? Do you want to be a disciple of God? Not just a follower, not just one in the crowd that's along for the ride. Do you really want to be a disciple? Do you want to follow the example of Jesus and live for God? If that's you, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can become your disciples that we have the opportunity to follow you, that we have the opportunity to learn from your example to live for you. God, forgive us. God, forgive me when I've chosen to deny God and live for myself. It's easy to do when we live in this world. The easier choice is to live for ourselves and be selfish and self-promoting and self-gratifying. But God, I know from my own life, it always goes so much better when I deny myself and choose to live for you. It doesn't always work out, but it's always in accordance to your will and your plan. And that's a much better place to be. God, we thank you that you created us, that you called us, that you have a plan for us. Help us to live for you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Our praise team will sing a, a hymn of response, a song of response. It's an opportunity for you to respond to what it is that God's doing in your life. We have altar areas for you to come and pray. Pastor Mary Lane will be here at the front, and I'll be over here on this side. If you'd like for one of us to pray with you, you're welcome to come. Would you stand as we sing? How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch's treasure How great the pain of sin Which by the chosen one bring many sons to glory.
As Jesus hung on the cross, his earthly life ebbing away from him, he cried out, it is finished. He wasn't talking about his earthly life. He wasn't talking about some process or something that was going on. He was talking about the plan of salvation. You see, in the Old Testament, animals had to be sacrificed. They were sacrificed every year because they were incomplete. It was just kind of a foreshadow of what was to come. And as Jesus cried out, it is finished, he meant that he had finished, he had completed the task that the Father had given him, and that was to be the sacrifice for you and I. The Bible tells us that he became the sacrifice once and for all. As we take this symbolic body of Christ, be reminded that he is the sacrifice not for all, but for you. Do this in remembrance of him. As Jesus had gathered with the disciples in that upper room, the supper was over, he took a cup that was filled with wine. And he began to teach them about a new covenant. You see, the old covenant was about the shedding of blood of animals. And he said, there's a new covenant. And he said, this is my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sin. Do this in remembrance of him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, for me. We thank you that through that gift, we receive forgiveness and eternal life. We worship this morning in Jesus' name, amen. There are many ways that we worship through song, through reading of the scripture, through communion, through our offering. It's a chance for you to participate in the ministries of the Highlands Church. If you're here with us in the building, we have baskets that are along the back wall where you can give your offering. If you're watching online, we are thankful that you worship with us and you can participate through online giving, either through our website, which you see there on the screen, or through Venmo. Uh, For those of you here in-house, in a couple of weeks, we'll have a a little uh, session on how to use Venmo if that's something that you're looking to do but are not familiar with. So many ways to give and participate in the ministries of our church. I want to thank Jacob Wiley and Chris McFalls and Richard and Jacob Henderson uh, who have restored our playground to full functionality. 
Over the years that we've been here at this property, we had that wonderful playground. One of the first things that I saw when I came to the Highlands Church was that wonderful playground and how important that was to reach children and families, and it had fallen into some disrepair. And so we thank them for spending their efforts and energies and resources uh, to accomplish that. It even held me. I went out there and got on it. So uh, go out and check it out and see all the wonderful work they've done. If you're interested in becoming a member of the Highlands Church, uh, we do the Highlands 101, which is a way to get to know who we are and the different ministries that we have. Uh, we're going to be doing that next Sunday. Uh, if you'll sign up out in the lobby or online, if you're planning on coming, if you'll just give us a note, you want to sign up for Highlands 101, we'll be glad to plug you in there. Would you receive now the benediction? Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we are your children, that we can choose to be disciples. Father, give us the courage and the desire to be your disciples and to deny ourselves and live for you so that we can be a positive influence on those around us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.